Welcome to today's webinar brought to you by Orisher Technologies and Priam. Orisher Technologies is a global leader in oral fluid substance abuse testing products. Their unique assays provide accurate and easy to administer testing methods to help determine the presence or absence of drugs or alcohol in a person's system. Oral fluid based testing products provide a simplified collection process, faster results, cost savings with minimal risk of tampering and dramatically reduced risk of adulteration. The Intercept Oral Fluid Drug Test is an FDA cleared laboratory based oral fluid drug testing system that enables accurate testing for drugs of abuse including marijuana, cocaine, PCP, amphetamines, and opiates. It was ranked as the number one recognized brand name in oral fluid testing in a 2014 National Drug Testing Industry Survey. With a fast and easy to administer collection process, Intercept is ideal for workplace, criminal justice, drug treatment centers, and clinical setting screening programs, among others. Today's presentation is entitled, Managing Workers' Compensation Costs Through Advanced Drug Testing Methods, and will be presented by Bill Curran and Mark Pugh. Bill Curran is the president and founding partner of the Current Consulting Group and the publisher of the online ultimate guide to state drug testing laws. He is the author of 10 books on substance-related issues, including the popular title, Why Drug Testing? CCG is a leading provider in drug testing policy writing services and works with companies to help them optimize their drug testing ROI. He also administers the annual drug testing industry survey now in its 16th year. Mark Pugh is the Senior Vice President at Priam who, and brings 30 years of experience in the property and casualty technology and healthcare industries to this presentation. Working in a variety of roles with Priam since 1989, Mr. Pugh currently develops strategies for managing and overutilizing the prescription drugs and workers' compensation and educates st stakeholders. He created Priam's Medical Intervention Program in 2003 and has since refined the program and created several other service, services to address the prescription drug epidemic. Mr. Pugh has addressed the National Workers' Compensation and Disability Conferences and numerous states' work, workers' comp and self-insured association conferences. He is also a member of the Medical Issues Committee of International Association of In Industrial Accident Boards and Commissions. It will now be our pleasure to hear from Bill Curran and Mark Pugh. Well, thank you, Jessica, and welcome to everybody who's on today's webinar. First, I'd like to uh, acknowledge Horsher Technologies for hosting and sponsoring today's webinar. We appreciate that very much. Uh, Orisher hosts a monthly series of webinars each year, and it has been my pleasure to be associated with these webinars over the past uh, several months. And I'm particularly excited today to be co-presenting with Mark Pugh from Priam. Mark has a vast amount of experience in workers' compensation issues. And as we talk about the issues that necessitate drug testing, so much of it comes back to accidents and that lead to workers' compensation claims that lead to costs that employers are trying to deal with. And so I'm real excited about Mark's part of today's presentation. I'm going to sort of set the table a little bit here at the beginning for Mark, and then following his remarks, we'll talk a little bit more about an advanced form of drug testing, lab-based oral fluid drug testing. I was just at a symposium yesterday in Washington, D.C. on the issue of marijuana and drug testing with the legalization of marijuana for medicinal purposes and in, in a few instances, uh, as in Colorado and Washington, for recreational use. And the subject came up about oral fluid testing. I'll share a little bit about that with you later in today's presentation. But I'm going to start out just by sharing a few statistics that have just come out from the federal government. Each year, the federal government puts out a survey, the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, and it measures the magnitude of the drug problem in a whole variety of ways. And so we'll talk a little bit about that, and then I'll turn the mic over to Mark. In 2013, okay, so this is the study that was released this year measuring levels of drug abuse during the calendar year 2013. It is estimated that over 24 million Americans, 12 and older, admit to being current illicit drug users. And the government defines a current illicit drug user as someone who used an illicit drug at least once in the month prior to participating in the survey. So, of course, you can see some problems with that 
when you consider, and I've seen the actual survey instrument that they use, they identify themselves as conducting the survey on behalf of the federal government, and then they proceed to ask the person on the other line, on the other side of the line, you know, about their illegal drug use. And so some of these numbers are probably lower. In fact, the government did a study on this survey, and the conclusion was that the numbers were about a third lower than they probably really are. If that's the case, then that estimated 24.6 million is probably closer to 32 or 33 million individuals who admitted during the survey that they'd used an illicit drug at least one time in the last 30 days. That's over 9% of the population in the United States 12 and older. 22.5 million current illicit drug users over the age of 18, so these are adults, were employed either full or part-time. That's almost 69%. That's a, that's a fairly high number. It hasn't been that high in several years. In fact, you'd have to go back probably 15 years to when it was basically right around 70 to 72 percent. So that percentage is creeping up. It was lower than this last year. It's come up again this year. Also a frightening statistic is the percentage of unemployed adults who are also current drug users, 18.2 percent. That's a pretty significant percentage also. For employers who have been tempted to perhaps try to cut costs by eliminating their, eliminating their pre-employment drug testing program, really need to look at this report. When you consider that 18%, and that again, that percentage is probably a third lower than what it really should be. So, you know, we're looking at another 6 7% on top of this 18.2 of unemployed Americans 18 and older being current drug abusers. It really sort of necessitates, I mean, it really makes it critical that, that companies do pre-employment drug testing. And then you see the breakdown. And, of course, you would, you would guess that marijuana would be the number one drug of abuse. And it is, of course. 19.8 million Americans admit to using marijuana in the last 30 days. And let me say that if you want to, you can go deep into the statistics of this report, and it will break it down by past month drug use, past 12-month drug use, and then lifetime drug use. And so as you get into those broader periods of time, for example, if, if you're measuring – uh, individuals who admit to using an illicit drug at least once in the last 12 months, then the number really sort of skyrockets. And then a lifetime, somebody who's tried drugs at least once in their lifetime, that really goes high. But marijuana, the number one drug of abuse, no, no question about that. Then the whole category, the family of prescription drugs, cocaine, hallucinogens, uh, inhalants, and, and heroin. And the heroin number is really somewhat deceiving uh, as we look at this horizontal bar graph because there is a heroin epidemic going on in the United States right now. We're starting to see those heroin numbers come up, and in certain parts of the country, they are increasing at an alarming rate. So even though it's a low number here, it is an epidemic that has come back into vogue, so to speak, among drug users. Marijuana is still number one, and then that whole family of prescription drugs, psychotherapeutic drugs, is number two. Just so you can see sort of where you're at with that. And the reason I bring this up is because when we talk about drug testing, it's important that you understand which drugs people are taking. Because if you're not testing for the drugs people are taking, then you really can't say you have a drug-free workplace. And that's part of the issue behind the legalization of marijuana. 23 states, Mark's going to talk a lot bit about this perhaps, but 23 states have legalized marijuana for medicinal purposes. And some employers may be tempted to not test for marijuana. Bottom line is they still have the right to do it. It's still legal, illegal under federal law. But as you can see, if you're not testing for marijuana, then you definitely can't claim that you have a drug-free workplace because that is the drug that the vast majority of drug users use. And all of this drug abuse has a direct impact on the workplace in a variety of ways, in terms of work quality, in terms of productivity, in terms of absenteeism, all of these things that we, we, we always talk about. They're, they're problems that happen in the home that carry over into the workplace, and it creates problems for the employer. And some of it's quantifiable. We know that as much as 50% of all workers' comp compensation claims can be related or can trace back to workplace substance abuse, and that substance abusers are far more likely to file a workers' compensation claim than their non-using coworkers. They utilize their medical benefits at a higher rate, they're absent from work at a higher rate, and they're at least a third less productive than the non-using coworkers. 
this is important because it all comes back to the bottom line. If you're concerned about what substance abuse is costing your company, you need to know these numbers. There was a study done by the U.S. Navy. It's, it's an old one. I don't think the number's gone down, though. I think it's probably gone up, but this is the number I'll use. Wherein the Navy estimated that a typical substance abuser costs his or her employer about $7,000 a year. That's just in lost productivity and replacement costs. That doesn't even get into the issues Mark's going to talk about. The monetary cost of workplace substance abuse overall is in the billions of dollars. But if I'm an employer, I'm concerned about that $7,000 number. And I'm also frightened by the fact that it's about a 15-year-old study that came up with that 7000 The number's probably, as I said, higher today. But that's the part that impacts me if I'm a small business owner. If I have a substance abuser on my payroll, and we know that nearly 69% of all substance abusers are employed, then there's a likelihood that I'm losing $7,000 a year for each one of them. And so if 15% of my 100 workers are substance abusers, then I can take that 15, that's 15% of 100, right? I just use simple, simple numbers that I could do the math with, and I multiply it by 7,000, and it's cost me a lot of money. And that's where drug testing comes in, into play. But the problem is that this number from the Navy, as I said, doesn't even cover accidents and workers' compensa compensation claims. And that's a big part of the problem today. That's where a lot of the cost is coming from. And so that's a nice segue into Mark's part of the presentation, I'm going to transfer controls over to Mark so that he can take us through um, a series of slides that explain the workers' comp angle to all of this. Go ahead, Mark. Thanks, Bill. I appreciate the opportunity to be a part of this. Um, if you ask my wife, um, she would say that walking could definitely be dangerous because every time that I used to go on to Thanksgiving holiday, she would just pre-pack my crutches. Um, because she knew that I was going to get hurt and she would have to be the one to drive home. Well, if you look at the statistics, and I don't know if you know, but 10,000 steps per day is supposed to be the optimal number of steps that you take on a daily basis in order for optimal health. Well, if you uh, look at the American Council on Exercise, 4,300 steps per day for an office worker. So if you're like me and spend a lot of time at a desk um, or a lot of time in airports, um, you're going to have to work extra time in order to get those 10,000 steps. Construction workers, 9,600. Mail carriers, uh, almost 19,000 steps. But what happens is that when you're walking and you're not paying attention, uh, you're cognitively impaired. There's a variety of things that could be happening, uh, comorbidities, diseases of life, different things like that. You can slip and fall. Um, and those slip and falls can lead to employee absences, um, obviously out of work. Um, high work comp claims, and I'm going to go into some statistics about that, and reduced employee morale as well because you've got people dropping like flies left and, around, left and right around you. So let's look at a Liberty Mutual study um, that was done in regards to workplace safety. Um, now, you may think that falls on, the, on uh, lower levels, like falling downstairs or falling off ledges, um, would be the uh, primary way that people uh, hurt themselves for building falls. Um, but that's only the fourth leading cause. The second leading cause um, are falls on the same level um, where you're literally just slipping and falling. Now, uh, uh, just for an FYI, the first leading or the leading cause is overexertion, things like lifting, pushing, pulling, holding, carrying, throwing. Um, but just the, the, the falls on the same level cost $6 billion or 13% overall of direct cost associated with, uh, with work incident. And they grew 25% from 2005 to 2013. So we've got some issues with people paying attention and people slipping and falling. And when you look at the National Safety Council, $70 billion with a B are associated with slip and falls on the same level per year in workers' comp and medical costs. And if you're in workers' comp, uh, you understand that we're in the healthcare business. Um, it used to be when my daughter asked me what I did for a living, I went into my five-minute elevator pitch about workers' compensation and cost mitigation and, and prescription drug overutilization. Her eyes started glazing over, and she started texting about three words into it. So I finally figured out that the best way to explain it is that I'm in the healthcare industry. Well, if you've been in work comp for a long period of time, that's not necessarily what you signed up for. But the fact that two-thirds of, uh, of costs uh, uh, associated workers' comp um, are related to medical, not indemnity, 
we've gone from a financial instrument of restoring uh, job loss and restoring uh, costs associated with being out of work into a healthcare industry. And that's a lot of what happens. Um, the leading cause of death in the workplace is slip and falls. Uh, if you slip and fall the same level, you're going to stay away from work longer eight days than injured in the other causes six days. So something as easy as just slipping and falling on the ground can create significant problems. And the Bureau of Labor Statistics came up with something similar. 65% of fall-related injuries are the same level. So what you would think is relatively benign, and obviously there's a variety of ways that people get hurt, and sometimes when people get hurt, they get hooked on opioids. They get highly dependent upon benzodiazepines. They start using medical marijuana where it's appropriate. Um, and then you've got other issues besides the illness and the injury. So what are some reasons for the slip and fall? Well, obviously, if floor surfaces, uh, surfaces are wet or damaged, weather hazards. Uh, we dealt with a, a patient one time that unfortunately passed away. He was a used car salesman. Um, and he was in the north, uh, and at some point during the winter, uh, he slipped and fell on the ice, um, and things got worse. He had some comorbidities associated with it, developed some infection in going into the hospital, and eventually he died, and the work comp payer was trying to understand how much of the death uh, was associated with that original slip and fall on ice in the parking lot. Um, so there's a variety of things that you need to be uh, uh, consistent with from a, safe, from a workplace safety standpoint to remove those hazards. Um, obviously, carelessness or lack of attention, um, people not necessarily paying attention. One of my pet peeves when I'm walking through the air airports is that people completely oblivious to their surroundings and stop in the middle of the hallway. And you can hear the screeching of uh, tennis shoes on the floor as people are trying to work their way around this person who had absolutely no idea that there were other people in the airport along with them that might be walking at the same pace they are and their sudden inattention and carelessness associated with that um, created issues. What certainly can happen is um, if, you, uh, uh, if you have issues with dragging your feet um, or you're just not paying attention or those poor people that just can't pull their eyes off of their cell phones and are texting while they're walking. Uh, texting while driving is illegal in most states. I think texting while walking probably should be illegal as well. There's been um, some stories. I heard one in New York City where someone was walking down the street and fell down one of the manholes. Um, anybody paying attention would have certainly seen it, but she was busy on her phone texting and didn't see it. So that can be certainly a problem. Uh, chronic illness, lifestyle diseases, uh, you know, uh, obesity obviously is an epidemic. Now, we tend to toss the word epidemic around a lot. Um, uh, it, with, when you're talking about opioids, it certainly is an uh, epidemic. Um, as Bill mentioned, heroin use has increased because we've made it a little bit more difficult for people to get their Oxycontins and Opanas, um, and so the heroin dealers are taking supply to demand. Well, we've got an epidemic in heroin as well, but we do have an, her uh, an epidemic on obesity. We're not getting out enough. We're not exercising that enough. We're not doing the 10,000 steps per day. Um, we're not eating right, we're not sleeping right, we have poor nutrition habits. There's just a variety of things, highly sedentary lifestyles, and all of those create significant problems. So if you've been paying attention recently, you've noticed that there's a tremendous imp uh, uh, focus on workplace wellness programs. Uh, and some of those include like wellness screening. So they'll look and ask, uh, do you get seven to eight hours of sleep? What's your nutrition habits? Um, do you smoke? Um, how much exercise do you get? Um, there are motivating lifestyle changes. There are several employers um, that have uh, gyms on site, um, or they will incentivize their uh, employees to exercise. Um, Fitbits and different things like that that can measure uh, uh, exercise and rest and whatnot. Uh, I saw one employer that actually paid to have a Fitbit-type device installed uh, on each of their, that sounds weird, um, for each of their employees to wear. Um, and they had competitions among offices to see how many people uh, were doing better uh, from their original um, heart rates or BMI or different things like that. Smoking cessation. We've obviously heard about that for a long period of time. The syntax, um, it, there are some people that are so addicted or dependent upon uh, tobacco products 
you could charge them 5,000% taxes on it from a sin tax standpoint, and they'd still figure out some way to pay for it. But those that don't want to pay that level of taxation um, will figure out a way to get out of that. But um, if you have uh, health insurance policies, especially from a group standpoint with an employer, um, you will get better rates um, if people are non-smokers. Proper nutrition. Um, a lot of folks, you know, Michelle Obama has uh, tried to implement better nutrition in schools, um, and the schools apparently uh, don't like that because the portions are smaller and the food doesn't taste as good. But at least it was an effort to try to get parents, to get uh, teachers, to get um, children or school, school kids to eat better, to have better nutrition. Uh, proper vaccinations um, to make sure uh, that you're dealing with that. So there are a lot of things that employers are trying to do to aid the wellness and the effectiveness of, the, of, of their employees. Psychosocial management. Um, there's always uh, been a lot of uh, different things where you can call 1-800 numbers and talk about the stress in your life. Talk about how to, how to manage the stress at your work. Maybe even manage the stress with your supervisor. Maybe manage the stress at home. Because as Bill mentioned, a lot of things that happen at home bleed into uh, the satisfaction at work, bleed into the capabilities and the productivity at work. Um, and so from a full standpoint, from a 360 view, having someone who's well-adjusted, who has a good family life, who has a good home life, um, who, ha who has good coping skills, who manages their stress well, who has an opportunity to advance in their career um, at, at their current employer or elsewhere, that they're given skills and tools to get better over time. That psychosocial management is another component of those wellness programs. And then obviously on-site nursing um, is something if you've been uh, seeing a lot of employers, especially ones uh, where there are high incidences of injuries, not just slips and falls, but other kind of injuries, where they'll have nurses on-site um, or nurses on call. Uh, for someone who sprains their ankle, and rather than going to an ER and maybe getting one of those doctors that prescribes Vicodin for everything as opposed to just the uh, Boy Scout rice, rest, ice, compression, elevation, and you get a nurse who can help that uh, injured worker kind of figure out, hey, you really don't need to get doped up on drugs. You just need to get some uh, Epsom salts and some, wa some warm water. You put some ice on it. You take some Aleve, um, and in a couple of days, you're going to be perfectly fine. So having uh, clinical resources on site uh, that help those small problems from becoming disasters. And I, I mean disasters from a health standpoint, disasters from a financial standpoint. Uh, the tsunami that we had in workers' comp about five or six years ago was the concept of MSAs and the settlement process, where all of a sudden we hadn't been paying that much attention, but uh, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services required us to set aside money so that Medicare wouldn't pay for injuries or, or treatment associated with work comp injury. And so we had to do lifetime medical expense uh, evaluations. And all of a sudden, we started figuring out that this 35-year-old was going to live another 36.7 year, years. And because of the drugs that he was on and because of the prospective treatment that they're anticipating, it was going to cost $700,000 um, for that Medicare set-aside. It used to be what I call the aha moment, but it became the OMG moment in regards to that because nobody is going to settle when it comes to that. Well, what you want to do is you want to be proactive. You want to have people who are in good health, who are in good spirits, who their mind is in the right place, who their home is, is in a good spot so that they can not only be productive while they're at work, um, but they can also reduce the amount of injuries, therefore reducing the amount of work comp costs. Um, older workers. Uh, in fact, Lloyd, you probably have heard this already, but by 2025, so about 11 years from now, there's going to be 31.5 million workers 55 years or age of, or older. Um, the statistics I've heard is that you are at your optimal health from a, from a physical standpoint at 18. So everything's downhill from 18 at that point. So we've got a bunch of people that are going to be older, they bring with that a variety of diseases of life. Um, back in the day, people would just die at 35, at 40. We really didn't know what happened. They just kind of dropped dead. The, the anomaly was someone to live into their 70s and 80s. Now it's kind of an anomaly for people not to live to their 70s or 80s or into their 90s. And stuff that we'd never really realized uh, was, was there because people didn't live long enough to see it, like cancer 
like osteoarthritis, like rheumatoid arthritis. All of those things contribute to uh, workplace injuries. Um, not only do they contribute to workplace injuries because you don't have the strength, you don't have the range of motion, um, you may not have the, the skills in order to pick up your feet because you develop peripheral neuropathy over time, and so you kind of drag your feet, and then it doesn't really take much to make you, help you fall. So not only do the injuries increase, but the severity of the injuries increase um, because uh, if you have osteoarthritis, um, you have calcium deficiency, your vitamin D isn't up to the point because you're inside all the time, you're not getting any natural sunlight, you're not taking supplements, your bones may be a little bit more brittle. Um, and so what would be a sprained uh, uh, wrist for a 36-year-old becomes a broken wrist um, for a 55-year-old. So all of that contributes um, to not only slip and falls, but any kind of injuries in the work comp. And obviously, uh, those injuries contribute to costs associated with it as well. But then on top of that, kind of back to our main subject, you have cognitive impairment. Workplace, workplace drug abuse costs businesses $81 billion a year and annually uh, in um, uh, productivity. So when, the, uh, when your employee comes in drunk um, or was drinking overnight um, and hasn't quite got his wits about him um, or ate that special brownie in the morning or they did the wake and bake. You haven't heard of wake and bake. Some people drink coffee to wake up in the morning get going. Some people smoke a joint. That's called wake and bake. So you got people who do that that don't necessarily like their lives, don't necessarily like reality. Um, they, if you give the option to fight or flight, they flight all the time. They never fight through issues. They don't have coping skills. They don't manage things well. Um, and so they abuse substances, whether it be alcohol or illicit drugs like heroin or cocaine or medical marijuana or prescription drugs or whatever. Um, they come in cognitively impaired. They're not thinking properly. Um, they may think slower. They may react slower. Uh, so having someone who is on a prescription drug issue a prescription drug regimen of opioids and benzodiazepines for anti-anxiety uh, and muscle relaxants because of muscle spasms in their back. And they come in and you're asking them to drive a forklift in a nuclear power plant. Probably not a good idea because they're, they're, they're a danger to themselves as well as a danger to other folks. So that cognitive impairment is what you're trying to get out in front of in regards to testing to ensure that they when, when they come to work, um, that they know that they're there, that they're ready to work, that they're going to be highly productive to work, and they're not going to be a danger to themselves or anybody else. Obviously, drug use then translates to work comp claims. And by increased work comp claims, that obviously increases work comp costs. It increases work comp premiums. It increases friction. It reduces morale. Uh, it increases the disparity sometimes between the employer and the employee because they're antagonistic towards one another. The employee thinks the employer is trying to take advantage of them. The employer thinks the employee is just making this stuff up because he doesn't have, don't want to come back to work. Um, and you've got physicians who may or may not have the right skill, expertise, or motivation in treating the patient. And you've got a variety of other stakeholders um, that are incentivized and motivated uh, to have claims remain open, including attorneys. And so the drug use and, and the use of the drugs, not only prescription but non-prescription and illicit drugs, um, create some significant problems. So if you're going to introduce a drug-free workplace, which ultimately should be your goal as an employer, say we have zero tolerance in regards to someone coming into work cognitively impaired, well, in Ohio, if you can prove over five years that you've had uh, a drug-free workplace and it's been functional, then your work comp premiums will, re will be reduced by 20%. In Georgia, uh, you don't have to have proof over five years, but they'll reduce your work comp premiums by 7.5%. In Alabama, Arkansas, Florida, Hawaii, Mississippi, South Carolina, Tennessee, Virginia, Washington, they all reduce your work comp premiums by 5%. Um, Idaho is apparently still thinking about it. But um, the concept here is if you have a drug-free workplace, a policy that's in place that the employee has to sign on to, that the employer uh, uh, mandates and actually manages and enforces, then there's an assumption that because you have a zero tolerance, because you have a drug-free workplace, 
that the cognitively impaired people, the people who are less uh, prone to productivity, are not going to be there because you're going to recognize that and you're going to disinvite them from coming into work. So obviously, if you have a drug-free workplace and it's working, the people are not taking drugs that they shouldn't or not taking drugs that would be impairing impairment. Or they used to be a forklift driver, but because they're in legitimate chronic pain and they need some level of medication that has been validated against evidence-based medicine as the most appropriate way for them to manage that pain, in addition to activity, in addition to physical therapy and so forth. But they've come up with a drug regimen that does intend to cognitively impair them. You as an employer have figured out a way to put them into a job that that cognitive impairment does not create issues for creating workplace injuries. So maybe they're not a forklift driver. Maybe they're filing papers in the filing cabinet. Something to get them to work because anybody who has dealt with return to work, anybody who has dealt with workers' comp understands that um, the, the, uh, the discrepancy in returning to work creates significant problems. The, there are all, most people get great value from going to work. The socialization associated with it, the self-esteem that comes with it, the concept of teamwork, they're not in their bedroom uh, in a dark room, kind of like a mushroom, feeling sorry for themselves because they're in pain, but they're actually going out and taking, man taking control of their life, managing their pain, not letting their pain manage themselves. And so they realize if you've got someone like that, you're going to be better suited in getting them back to work as quickly as possible. Well, you need to make sure that they're in a good place where uh, whatever, may be, whatever they may be doing to medicate themselves is addressed that. Um, a drug-free workplace and the lack of drugs in the workplace reduce absenteeism. Obviously, absence from work, but this is a, a new kind of term to me, presenteeism. Reduced, reduced performance while at work. So they're not productive. Um, they're cognitively impaired, so they're not really paying attention. Or their issues at home have them uh, disillusioned uh, 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 about their, uh, their place in this world. And so they're not necessarily thinking about their job. That reduced present presenteeism um, can be a associated with a drug-free workplace. So if you've got someone who's not on drugs, um, then they have a better chance of being a, a productive uh, employee in your employee. Medical marijuana is a little bit different um, in regards to drug-free workplace, though. Illinois is an interesting state in that medical marijuana is legal, but adding it specifically and explicitly to your drug-free workplace policy is also legal. And I heard some attorneys uh, mention that uh, a few months ago, and they said if you don't have explicit mention of medical marijuana in your drug-free workplace uh, policy in Illinois, that you're going to probably pay for it. And the issue with marijuana, um, especially when you talk about medical marijuana, you typically think about smoking joints or vaporizing or the special brownies or cookies or gummy bears, uh, those different things. Well, if you use it regularly, it can stay in your urine. You can test positive for THC from 7 to 100 days. And I realize that's a really large uh, range, but that's what they say. In their blood, 2 to 7 days. In your hair, it could last for months. Um, in saliva, maybe within one day, but they're not really sure. For, they don't have any really specific statistics on that. But if you're a regular user, that wake and baker that's using that as a way to deal with it, Let's say, take, for example, an uh, uh, employee goes home. Um, they smoke an e-cigarette that has uh, marijuana in, in it instead of liquid nicotine. And so they do that during dinner because they really had a stressful day. They don't really like their supervisor. They don't really like the way that their job has, has translated into what they're doing currently. And they use that to relax. Well, they come in the next morning from a vaporizing standpoint, um, that lasts, the effects, the cognitive impairment lasts about three to four hours, depending upon uh, how much they smoke. So let's say they do one e-cigarette, for example. So that's about three to four hours. They come in the following morning, they're probably not cognitively impaired. That effect, that psychoactive component of THC, has left their system as far as a cognitive impairment standpoint. But if you test them positive for THC, if you, po if you test them and they test positive for THC, it's going to come up and say they smoked. 
So how do you reconcile the, the cognitive impairment? If they fell down the stairs, is it because, or they just fell and slipped on the same level, is it because they weren't paying attention? Is it because they were paying attention more to their cell phone, their text messaging, um, and their walkie-talkie as opposed to walking? Or were they truly cognitively impaired still from the weed that they smoked last night? Um, so marijuana is, is an interesting subject, and it creates really interesting dialogue because it lasts in your system a lot longer from a testing standpoint, um, not commensurate with uh, the amount of time that it lasts in your system from an effect standpoint. And the fact that from a societal standpoint that we have tipped over to the point of accepting marijuana as, as socially acceptable, right now 23 states and, and the District of Columbia have made medical marijuana legal. Another 11 states have limited access product laws, like Alabama. You can get medical marijuana, the Charlotte's Web, but it, only has to, it can only be administered to University of Alabama, Birmingham. So if you look at that, 23 states plus 11 states, that's 34 states plus the District of Columbia um, that have approved some level of medical marijuana um, at this point. According to a Pew Research Center, um, in uh, 2009, 52% said marijuana should not be legal. This is a report that came out in April of this year. In 2014, though, 54% said marijuana should be legal. Big switch. My perspective, if we've got more than 50% of our society saying marijuana should be legal, 83% of them should, would approve any, some kind of form of legalization, whether it's medical or medical and recreational. Once we've gone beyond 50%, we've reached the point where it's socially acceptable. So if you haven't thought about marijuana, whether it be recreational or medical standpoint, if you haven't thought about that as an impact to your workplace, an impact to your drug-free workplace policies, an impact to your injuries, an impact to your work comp premiums, an impact to, you, to your uh, uh, workforce, um, you better think again because it's here and it's not going away. So with that, um, Bill, I'm going to turn it back over to you to take us the rest of the way, sir. Okay, great, Mark. Yeah, and let me just take you through a couple of um, sort of follow-ups to what Mark was talking. That was fascinating. I really enjoyed that. Um, let's spend a few minutes talking about lab-based oral fluid testing, but as it relates to what Mark was talking about, this connection between accidents in the workplace and, and other types of accidents, but those that are related to to substance abuse and then the connection to drug testing. And, I, and I've got a couple of questions for Mark that I'm going to ask at the end that I took note of while he was talking. But in particular, I thought it was fascinating, this whole issue of, um, of the marijuana laws and what effect that they're having on drug-free workplace efforts. And let me see if I can get to, yeah, so let, let me skip ahead a little bit to, to address this issue. When it comes to advanced drug testing methods, we're talking about instead of the traditional lab-based urine test, we're talking about lab-based oral fluid testing. We're talking about point of collection testing. That's where you get an instant result. We're also talking about lab-based hair testing. And so the window of detection that Mark was talking about is an interesting subject that's really a hot topic of debate in our industry right now because the federal government is in the process of developing regulations for lab-based oral fluid testing. This means that once those regulations are in place, employers who are mandated to do drug testing under some type of federal law will be allowed to choose between lab-based urine testing and lab-based oral fluid testing. Right now it's just lab-based urine, but those oral fluid regulations are in the works. And one of the questions that's come up is, that has come up is, what about the window of detection, particularly as it relates to marijuana? So first, the good news is, Yes, you can detect marijuana, THC, in oral fluid testing. But there's a big difference in the various technologies that are out there. So when we talk about marijuana detectability in oral fluid, you have to distinguish between lab-based oral fluid testing and POCT oral fluid testing. And that has a big part, plays a big role in the answer to the question. Yes, you can, but it depends on which testing method you're using as to whether or not you can detect it in, a, in an acceptable cutoff level range and also with an acceptable window of detection. With that Illinois chart that Mark had up there, it showed under saliva oral fluid testing that it was zero to 24 hours. 
with POCT oral fluid testing, it's a much tighter window of detection. With lab-based oral fluid testing, it's actually a broader window of detection. You can go beyond that 24 hours. It all depends on how much blood is in the, or excuse me, how much of the drug is in the individual's blood system at the time that the oral fluid sample is collected. And, and then that will determine the window of detection. So with oral fluid testing, it mimics blood, which means that almost immediately after an individual ingests the drug, it's going to be detectable in an oral fluid sample. Not so with urine testing, because there's at least an hour lag time, especially with marijuana. It will be an hour or so before that drug use is detectable in that particular urine sample that you collected. With oral fluid, you can detect that drug use immediately. That, so go back to Mark's scenario. So somebody goes out on their lunch break, they smoke a joint, they come back in, and they smell of marijuana, they're acting in a way that would cause one to have reasonable suspicion. If you do an oral fluid collection and send that sample off to the laboratory, they're most likely, almost absolutely, going to test positive. If you collect that urine, a urine sample from that individual, they're probably not going to test positive because, they're, again, there's that hour to two-hour lag time before that's going to be, the drug is going to be detectable in that individual's urine sample. And then you get to the issue of cutoff. So that's the chart that I have in front of you right now. You can see that 80% of the THC positives are below 50 nanograms per milliliter. So if you're using a testing device or system that cannot detect THC below 50 nanograms, and you'll see that most of the bars are far below that. They're 20, 25 nanograms per milliliter or lower. But if you're using a device that can't go below that 50 nanogram or 20, 25 nanogram, you're just not going to get the positives that you're supposed to get. And, and I'm not suggesting that the purpose of drug testing is to catch people, but certainly if you're going to use drug tests, if you're going to do drug testing, you want to get the positives you're supposed to get. Oral fluid testing can detect THC, but it depends on the testing method. That's why I always make the distinction with, between lab-based oral fluid testing and POCT oral fluid testing. Both are good. Both will accomplish what you want them to accomplish. You just need to know the capabilities of each of the various test testing methods because that will determine whether or not you accomplish your objectives. And with oral fluid testing, you want to make sure that you're able to detect the drugs that are in the system at the time that the, at the, um, that the sample is collected. The difference between oral fluid testing and urine testing, as I show here on the slide number two, is that with an oral fluid sample, from a scientific standpoint, you're able to detect the parent drug as well as the metabolite of the drug. So you're able to detect the drug itself as well as the metabolic breakdown of the drug. Whereas with urine testing, you're typically only going to detect the metabolites of the drug and not the parent drug. So the parent drug is in the oral fluid sample that you collect, you're able to detect that. And that's why you can, you can detect drug, drug use so quickly after somebody's used drugs, which makes it ideal for, say, a post-accident drug test or a reasonable suspicion drug test because the drug is, is right there. It's in the system. The accuracy of the device or the testing system that you're using it will depend on a number of things. And I always I make these suggestions to people who are looking for a drug testing method to use, uh, or excuse me, a, a particular product or, or provider that they're going to use. You know, look for empirical data. Don't, don't read the marketing material, but, which is good. We write a lot of marketing material. But you want to look at independent empirical data from peer-reviewed journals. You want to look for an FDA-cleared device. You want to, you know, check out the referrals. You, you want to ask for some sample product and put it to the test, put it to the test against the package insert that comes with it. And when it comes to the FDA clearance, you're not only looking for an FDA-cleared collection device, the device that you're going to collect the oral fluid sample in, but you want also FDA-cleared assays that the laboratory is going to test in the laboratory. So it's not simply a matter of the device, but the testing system. And so you could be using a device, even a, even a collection system, that's testing and it's sending it to the laboratory and you're testing for, for say, eight, nine, ten drugs. But you've got to make sure that each of those drugs, that there's an FDA-cleared assay for that drug so that the laboratory is, is getting the best 
possible quality result with that test. And so accuracy depends on a lot of different things. And if you're looking at the positivity rate as sort of the, the, uh, the marker of accuracy, these are some statistics that came from over 4.5 million drug tests. The middle column, it says intercept, which, of course, is the Orisher device. But that represents lab-based oral fluid testing. And the column to the right is typical urine testing. And you can see the overall positivity rate a little bit higher with urine than, it, than with lab-based oral fluid testing. But almost all of it, well, all of it actually is right there on that first line with amphetamine, where the, per, high, uh, the positivity rate was much higher than with uh, oral fluid testing. But in all the other drag, drug categories, higher, equal to or higher with uh, lab-based oral fluid testing. And in particular, go down to the THC line, you can see that the positivity rate was slightly higher with lab-based oral fluid testing than with urine testing. Again, lending credence to this idea that lab-based oral fluid testing is a viable option even when testing for oral fluid or for marijuana. And let, let me move ahead just a little bit more because I, I, I want to show you this window of detection chart. This is really important as well. You can see the, the red line represents blood, the blue oral fluid, and the yellow urine. And so that really sort of demonstrates, it illustrates the window of detection and how it opens up almost immediately after somebody has ingested a drug versus urine, which you have that lag time of an hour or two hours, depending on the drug. And the window of detection, of course, goes out farther for urine. It goes out three to four days at the cutoff levels that we typically use. Even though the THC will still be detectable in, in somebody's urine, it won't come up in the drug test as positive because of the cutoff levels that we're using. With oral fluid, you're going to have a longer window of detection with lab-based oral fluid testing than you would with POCT oral fluid testing, which I don't make the distinction in this particular chart but it is a little bit longer than with blood testing. Now let me explain hair real quickly because that's also an advanced testing method and one that I recommend, but in certain circumstances. So you can see the window of detection does not open with hair testing for a number of days, usually somewhere around seven days. So if somebody is smoking a joint over the weekend, you test them on Monday, they're not gonna test positive in a hair test. But about a week later, that hair test will render a positive result, most likely but the window of detection goes out for a period of months, usually about 90 days. So if you're looking for sort of a lifestyle indicator on a pre-employment exam, or excuse me, drug test, then you're probably gonna be very happy with hair testing. But if you're looking for a recent use indicator, a, a, a test that matches well with post-accident testing, then oral fluid's probably what you're looking for because the window of detection opens up immediately after the use of the drug and that's when you're concerned about, about the drug use. Again, the positivity rates, and I took you through these THC uh, charts. We're sort of getting towards the close here, and I wanna make sure we have time for some Q&A with Mark. So let me just make a couple of closing points when it comes to oral fluid testing. One of the reasons why the federal government is so interested in lab-based oral fluid testing is because the science is sound. I mean, the science matches well right up equally with lab-based urine testing. But the collection process is a big differentiator. There are no gender collection issues. There, there are no problems with observed collections, which is part of the federal regulations for drug testing. That, that reasonable suspicion drug test, for example, among other scenarios, have to be observed collections. Well, if you're observing somebody voiding a urine sample, that's different than somebody who's watching another person provide an oral fluid sample or a sample of their saliva. So every oral fluid collection is observable because there are no, no issues with the collection process itself. You don't have to secure a restroom. You don't have to, to change the uh, or put blue dye in the toilet water, turn off the hot water, ask people to empty their pockets, et cetera, because the donor and the administrator of the test are standing right in front of each other during the entire collection process. There are no gender issues of matching the donor and the administrator gender like you do in, say, criminal justice or law enforcement testing scenarios. Um, there are no shy bladder issues. The collection process is fairly simple. It just takes a few minutes, and I'm going to show you how that factors into the cost of drug testing in a, in a second here. So collections make a big difference when it comes to looking at the advantages of the different testing methods. Obviously, with oral fluid, it's a very simple, very non-invasive collection.
collection process, but it also influences the whole issue of drug test cheating. Now, there's no question that urine testing is susceptible to cheating. If you go onto the Internet, you do a Google search on beat the drug test, you're literally going to get hundreds of thousands of websites offering advice on how to beat a urine drug test. You're going to be inundated with offers to sell you a product, fake you know, synthetic urine, replacement urine from another source, um, products that, that promise to mask the presence of the drug in your urine, and on and on and on. But when it comes to oral fluid testing, there just really is no viable, proven way to beat an oral fluid drug test. And proof of that is found on these very same websites. I, I captured a couple of them, right? This is one where the best advice they could give you is avoid the test. Avoid submitting saliva. And then the other one says, between the periods of time that we're talking about, you must avoid being screened or you will surely test positive. I have another one. I didn't have time to put it up on a slide. I just recently found it. It's a website that offers a mouthwash product to, to sort of clean out your saliva before you get drug tested. I forget. I think it was $40 for the mouthwash, something in that neighborhood. But when you read the instructions, it says, stop using drugs for at least 24 hours and then rinse your mouth out with our product. Classic. When it comes to drug test cheating, even the cheaters know that there's really no way to cheat on a saliva or an oral fluid drug test. It's just, it's just not possible with the technology that, that's out there. Now, in closing, let me take you through a very quick explanation of the return on investment of lab-based testing versus urine, lab-based oral fluid testing versus urine testing. And so if you're in the business somewhere, you're an employer, uh, you, and you purchase drug testing from a provider, then you know you're dealing with the, the cost of your drug test is the collection, it's sending it to the laboratory, it's the analysis at the laboratory, it's the medical review officer who's going to confirm the, or verify the test results, et cetera. It's all of those things bundled together. The national average for collection fees is $17. You can get it a little bit cheaper, but oftentimes you're paying more than that. With oral fluid testing, you can have employees on your payroll who are trained to administer the, the test because it's so simple and easy to do. And there are no states that would prohibit you from being able to do that. So you can save that $17 if you want to. When you took a look at the, the lab analysis and the administration part of the drug test, the prices are very similar. Maybe on average it's a little bit higher with oral fluid testing than it is with urine testing, but very close in price. And then the medical review officer and the confirmation testing, that's usually bundled into the price of your test. So that $28 and $29 there, you're usually getting that quoted with all of these analyses and the MRO review bundled in together. But if you add that collection fee onto your, your test fee, then you're looking at a much higher out-of-pocket cost with urine than with oral fluid, about $45 versus $29. But the cost of drug testing doesn't stop there. There's more to it, right? Because with typical urine tests, you're sending an employee to an off-site collection site to provide a sample. And depending on the circumstances, like a post-accident test, you're probably sending a supervisor along with that individual. And so you've got to factor in the cost of lost productivity at the hourly rate of that worker and the supervisor that's going to go with him or her. And so I just use these numbers. You can plug in whatever numbers you want, but at an hourly rate of $10.10, with that worker being gone an hour and a half, that's $15.50 of lost productivity. And for the supervisor at $24, hours, $24 an hour, you're looking at $36 of lost productivity versus about 15 minutes of time that it takes to do the test at the work site. So the $10.10 uh, divided by a quarter of the hour is only $2.53 of lost productivity and only $6 of the supervisor's time at that same, with that same formula. So now the cost of drug testing has gone up another $51 plus for urine and $8.53 for oral fluid. If I add it all together, a typical urine test is costing me almost $100 versus less than $40 for the oral fluid test. You're still getting a lab-based result but the cost of the test itself in hard dollars 
as well as the soft dollars of the lost work time are a lot less with lab-based oral fluid testing. It doesn't mean that lab-based oral fluid testing is the testing method you should use, but you should know what you're up against when it comes to measuring the, test, the testing methods and what they actually cost. And I shared this with you earlier, the, just the importance of the FDA clearance of the device itself, as well as the assays that you're testing for. So as you can see on that bat bottom slide, you want to look for a device that has FDA cleared assays beyond just the normal four or five drugs that, that companies typically test for, marijuana, cocaine, opiates, amphetamine, and PCP. You want to go beyond that because if you're going to test, you want to test for the drugs that people are using today. And so you're, you, you're going to have these slides. If you want these slides, we will send them to you, and you'll have access to all of this data, the, the statistical data, as well as the, um, the information about uh, workers' compensation and uh, lab-based oral fluid testing. We don't have a lot of time left, and I had a couple of questions for Mark. Mark, is your mic still live? Yes, I'm still here. Okay. So in the time that we have left, let me ask you a couple of questions that, that have come through. One is, are you seeing an increase in the cost of workers' comp today, and do employers get the connection between drug abuse and accidents that lead to workers' comp? Uh, the in, there is definitely been an increase um, in cost to the system um, in regards to uh, prescription drug uh, overutilization um, uh, in the workers' comp industry. Everybody, I don't think anybody that that is that is paying attention in work comp hasn't heard the term opioid epidemic uh, at least hundreds of times in the past couple of years. Everybody is aware of the issues um, in dealing with chronic pain, uh, especially with opioids and then the, the polypharmacy regimens that you continue to add other drug classifications to it. Um, that certainly has increased. Um, some payers, some carriers, some third-party administrators, some pharmacy benefit managers, some of them do better jobs than others. Um, and the national average um, is that prescription drug costs um, are about 18% uh, of all medical costs inside workers' comp. And workers' comp, uh, I, last I re recall, uh, medical is about two-thirds of the cost of, uh, of work comp um, in the costs associated with So 18% of all those medical costs are prescription drugs. Now, I have spoken to some carriers and TPAs and pharmacy benefit managers um, where that is in the three to five percent range, so they're obviously doing a really good job uh, in proactively managing it, making sure that the uh, injured worker takes conservative steps: uh, physical therapy, yoga, Pilates, NSAIDs. NSAIDs are much better for the acute and subacute phases, rather than going to opioids. So they created a very tight structure and almost culture um, that we're going to take a more conservative route. Uh, then I've spoken to other uh, carriers and payers and whatnot, um, and they're in the 20 and 13, 30% range. So metaphorically, the prescription drugs are eating their lunch. Um, a lot of it is because they uh, are in states where the, the treating physician's opinion and treatment plan cannot be impugned. Um, the injured worker has all the power. There, there is no great dispute resolution process in place. Um, or there are doctors um, who have improper motivations. I think 3% of the doctors in California prescribe 55% of the opioids. They know who that 3% are, but they continue to treat work comp patients. Um, so in some cases, it, in some cases, the payer's fault. Um, they've not implemented the types of tools. They haven't sensitized their claims team uh, to understand that. Um, they haven't taken proactive steps and try to do that. So it's all over the board. But I say in, in general terms, everybody is aware of the opioid issue, um, but not everybody has taken control over it and managing it properly. And so, and I, I apologize if this sounds like a leading question to our audience, but given all of what you just said and some of the information you shared, or shared earlier, it would seem to indicate that drug testing in the workplace is, I mean, a necessity in today's world. Um, I think drug testing, certainly from a drug-free workplace uh, and, and, and creating a culture 
um, that we're not going to tolerate uh, illicit drugs. Um, if you're taking prescription drugs, there needs to be a legitimate clinical rationale for it. We need to find the proper place for you to work at. Um, that certainly is, uh, is appropriate, um, but that's just part uh, of the process, obviously. Um, the other part is to ensure that the injured workers get the most appropriate treatment up front um, and that a treatment follows evidence-based guidelines, it follows the science. Um, and in some cases, that does not require drugs. Um, and, and so in, in a perfect world, you have someone who gets injured um, and you take a conservative approach um, and they get better um, and without the use of drugs um, and therefore uh, they get back to work faster, uh, the, the claim costs are lower, and you may not even need drug testing on the back end to understand are they compliant with their drug regimen. So there's two different approaches. One is the proactive drug-free workplace, making sure that employees are not coming in cognitively impaired um, that could create more work comp claims and more work comp costs. That's a different issue than those who have become injured um, and are on a drug regimen. Then you need to figure out, is the drug regimen the most clinically appropriate treatment regimen for this patient? Um, if it is, then drug testing to ensure they're compliant with that is appropriate um, under certain, cer certain circumstances. Random but regular, you do something with the inconsistent results. Um, but in a perfect world, when someone gets injured, um, hopefully you can treat them quickly, proactively, and with as few drugs as possible to get them back to work to keep uh, not only your employee base happy, but also uh, your insurance carrier happy. And and I notice we're out of time here, so I'm about to turn it over to Jessica. But based on all of that, then, it, you know, if you're going to do drug testing, if you have to do drug testing, if you see the value in doing drug testing, then why not look at some of these advanced testing methods that uh, perhaps are a, a good fit with your company and the different circumstances that you find yourself in, either because collections aren't practical in the traditional urine testing way or because you're looking for a, a less invasive testing method that still renders a very positive result. Maybe the collections are the issue. Maybe drug test cheating is the issue, et cetera. Um, and, and that would lead you to, you know, looking at hair testing or, as we've talked about today, lab-based oral fluid testing in particular. Well, Mark, thank you very much. Um, and with that, I will turn the, uh, the microphone back over to Jessica for our conclusion. Thank you, Bill, and thank you, Mark. On behalf of Orisher Technologies, we hope that you have found today's presentation informative and helpful. This presentation was recorded, and you will receive instructions informing you how to access the recording. Thank you for your attendance today, and this concludes today's webinar.